Uh, it just means I know a few buzzwords and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I know sourcing, engaging, recruiting, or training. Uh, I have founded and I do organize plenty of tech user groups. I do a good deal of work, uh, at least in the New York metro area, with many of the larger uh, technical user groups. Uh, there's my LinkedIn profile. That is a real profile. It is not a fake one. Uh, you, if you connect with me, you will not be receiving uh, emails that pertain to uh, money that I have in an overseas account. Uh, my Twitter handle is there, Levy Recruits. Uh, that's my blog, RecruitingInferno.com. I'm really backlogged on that, so I apologize. And if you really want, just Google me. Take, take that whole phrase there, Steve hyphen Levy Place Recruiting. Pop it in there and be amused for about four or five seconds. Again, for the event, notice at the bottom right, hashtag RBC Live as opposed to RB Clive, which is something in the UK. Uh, two things that when you do get a chance, please read. Uh, Joel on software that Joel Spassky from uh, 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 Stack Exchange. He's got a couple of really good articles on interviewing techies. A great one to read is that one. And finally, uh, when it comes to code tests, I know lots of have these code tests that you think are great, but most of them probably suck. And this link will tell you, uh, give you a good idea of, of a better idea for uh, for code testing. Uh, clearly, you know we're all rock stars, which is why uh, you know many in the technical community uh, love us so much. And 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 the way I know. They love us so much is this ubiquitous picture that if you uh, Google recruiters are, you get recruiters are idiots, liars, scumbags, and parasites. Um, well, you know, there, there, are, there are plenty of people in our profession who have, who have helped uh, foist that impression uh, on us, and uh, we can do substantially better. What I'm going to talk to you now are about five quotes from friends of mine. These are fellows who run some of the larger technical user groups in the New York City area. Uh, last, sometime last year, I believe it was, we had a, a, a New York City recruiting meetup where I had the three of them sit, uh, and, and again, they're responsible for Python, .NET, and Perl. Collectively, there are about 13,000 developers that, for some reason, hang on these groups every word. So I, I, I moderated a panel, uh, and, and, and this presentation, there are going to be some R-rated words, so I apologize. Not really. Uh, the panel was called, Why Do Technical People Believe Recruiters Are Douchebags? So I asked them some, 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 uh, some, uh, this question, and these are the kind of things that they sent me. Not answering when I asked for more specifics about the kind of work such as the tech stack or interesting classes of problems. I get this one a lot, and my goal in asking for more details is to find out if I or someone I know might be a good fit. If you refuse to say anything more than uses Python, I'm probably not going to respond back to you. Uh, and again, this is a serious problem we have. Another friend of mine said, asking me if I'm interested in a job using a technology that appears nowhere on my resume at all, and yet clearly requires significant expertise in that technology. I'm sure some of you have done this, or are doing this today. Even more so, asking me to spam all my friends in exchange for an iPad in the off chance that one of them takes the job. Anybody do that one? Two more. Being entirely unwilling to provide the name of the company advertising the position. Look, none of us are, maybe some of us are neophytes. Um, the reason that we say those things is because we typically fear that someone's going to go around us. As far as I'm concerned, there's only one reason, one situation for keeping the name of the company at the first uh, point of engagement um, silent, and that's when there's an incumbent in the position. Finally, you know, calling people at work. The fellow who said this, um, I'll tell you about the situation, he said, calling me at work, or at all for that matter, I'm, I'm, I'm way more likely to answer you via email, and I'm not sure why I get the argument, no, trust me, I know how you want to be contacted. That line was spoken at by one recruiter at this meetup, and this fellow got out of his chair and he's like a cross between John Denver and Grizzly Adams. If, if you don't know those folks, Google you know, John Denver, Grizzly Adams, and think of them combined. He walked up to her and said, do I know you? And she was a little bit nervous. She goes, no. He says, what if I called you at work, got you on the phone, and asked you to marry me? Would you marry me? 
that's the same thing. Let's go a little bit into the technical mind is because, you know, not all people are alike. I know you think you have uh, ESP. There are many in our profession, uh, mostly those who have never been told otherwise. They believe they have ESP. They believe they can read between the minds. They believe that they can sense good talent. <laughs> can you smell what the resume is cooking? Um, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the coding wisdom that techies talk about that can be applied to our profession so we can understand them substantially better. Uh, and really, it's not that difficult to understand these people, but you have to take the time. You're not going to learn by osmosis. You're not going to be able to fake it till you make it, especially for the really good people. So here are some of the some some things that 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 devs say, and 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 I think we can apply those if we learn these and apply them to recruiting, understand them. I think we'll do a much you'll do a much better job of getting them engaged. When debugging, novices insert corrective code. Experts remove defective code. So one of the things that I like to talk about when I'm when I'm you know, working and engaging and recruiting technical folks, I want to get them to describe their projects, not just in words. Get them in front of a whiteboard. Let them draw out the architecture. You know, draw out the the flow. Uh, uh, you know, the the algorithm that the algorithm that they're using. Watch how they do that. Ask them to explain things that you don't understand. Even if you don't understand the technical stuff, the logic behind it should make sense. And that's a real big difference. Everyone wants to hire these great people who are superstars. God forbid we say the word rock stars. And, uh, uh, you know, the really good people are really good at taking away the really bad code. So this goes to uh, that one of those links I said earlier. When you apply it forward to your code test, it's often a better solution to give them really broken code and see how they fix it. Another piece of coding wisdom, and again, there are nine of these in all. Java is to JavaScript what car is to carpet. Think about that. And I tell you, don't try to fake it if you don't know what you are talking about. Because if you try to confuse, for example, Java and JavaScript, calling them the same things, Behind the uh, you know the eyes of that developer, they are thinking very very bad ugly things about you, and when you do that, not only do you make yourself look bad, but then they start going back into their communities and broad brush every recruiter as being a know nothing, stupid. They don't even know what we're talking about. How can they even recruit us? They don't even know what we do. They don't even know the difference between Java and JavaScript. Please do not fake it if you don't know it. If you do not know it. Just be honest and say, I don't know it. Uh, another thing that they like saying is it's hard enough to find an error in your code when you're looking for it. It's even harder when you've assumed your code is error free. So what I like to do is going back to the assessment piece, and all these things will tie in together. Um, if you use whatever code test you're using, you it's, it's probably been designed for a certain result in mind. What I like to do is give people very broken code or code that just is an absolute mess. It's not com no commenting, no documentation. And give people the exercise of fixing it, making it better, and then running through a presentation where they explain what they did and why they did. It's little different than just, you know, coming up, write a class for this, you know, write a function for that. We'll get to back to some more detailed stuff, more, more detailed elements of, of, of assessment a little bit later. Other coding wisdom. If debugging is the process of removing software bugs, then programming must be the process of putting them in. Uh, there are a couple of things that I like asking people during the presentation, during during the interview. Ask them, what do you think about this? If debugging is the process of removing software bugs, then programming must be the process of putting them in. 
you know, that's a that's a concept that if you're not a technical person as a recruiter, you can understand that stuff. And this is almost one of the soft interview questions that you can ask technical people just to get a dialogue going. And they should chuckle a little bit. And they should be able to talk about situations in which they've been on both sides of the fence. Great way of building rapport with them. Always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. Think about that. Always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. And you can ask them, how do you work in situations where some of the code is really bad? How do you respond to that? That's getting more towards the technical culture fit, but it starts tapping into that culture element that we all think we know intuitively, which in fact we, we don't. Coding wisdom for recruiters, more stuff. There is not now, nor has there ever been, nor will there ever be, any programming language in which it is the least bit difficult to write bad code. Very, very common flaws law. One of the things that um, happens in companies is, you know, the, the stack is defined by some, you know, high-flying, high-ego head of software development, software engineering, and who believe that their solution to, uh, you know, architecting and, and, and coding is the perfect one. I like to flip that on its side when it comes to getting a dialogue going. Um, somewhere later on in this presentation is a link to a, a blog post I wrote for a, 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 a company of mine uh, a couple of years back in which I uh, present something called the Logo Cloud. And that is, and you'll see a little bit later, it's, it looks in the front end, the back end, the cloud layer, source control, and has the logos of every bit of technology that's used in the entire stack. I like giving this, I like doing this for wherever I am and putting this in front of the, uh, you know, the interviewer, the, the interviewee, or even sending to them and asking for their opinions about alternatives to the existing stack, what they like. What do they dislike and why? Again, it's one of those things that get a dialogue going that even if you aren't, don't fully understand all the technologies, you can at least see how they're responding to one technology over the other. And then as a good recruiter, you can start digging in deeper, make notes of these, pass these on to the hiring manager, whatever works well. Most software today is very much like an Egyptian pyramid with millions of bricks piled on top of each other with no structural integrity, but just done by brute force and thousands of slaves. Uh, where every somebody goes in, there's always going to be legacy code. And the funny thing is that people all want to work on the new cool stuff, but the reality of it is there's always at some point in bringing people on board, they're going to be working with legacy code. You can't lie. You can't lie and tell folks they're always always going to be working on the leading edge stuff. It is something that is a reality in every software development environment, and it must be planned for, particularly in you know the recruiting phase. You can't just say you know talk about the good features of the car. You have to talk about the features that are perhaps a little less. Um, See a little, little less uh, sexy. Also, that goes back to the original concept of being completely honest. Any code of your own that you haven't looked at for six or more months might as well have been written by someone else. This is the very famous Eagleson's law. Think about this. Oh my goodness, the person has a code repository. They must be a superstar. Wow, I'm going to bring the code repo to the hiring manager. Won't they be proud of me? The problem is, when looking at code repos, and, and these are the things that people don't tell you, is that in many cases, uh, a person's code repo is where they, uh, they do their test development. They throw stuff up and see what people's reactions are to it. And in many cases, some of the code is really old. And six months in a software development world, there's so much you can learn, there's so much you can do in, in terms of improving yourself, that to solely base decisions on whether someone has a code repo or how many uh, uh, you know, commits they have, how many people are following them, 
it's folly, and it, and, it, and it gives the wrong impression that somebody might be better than they really are. And again, this is part of where, as a, as a recruiter searching for technical people, you have to understand these things. You have to be able to go in, do, for example, what people are following. You know, are they following some, uh, some code versus other code? The individuals who have the code repos, where are they actually um, integrating you know, and working well with other people? Is it just doing commenting? Is it, is, is it refactoring? Is it writing new stuff? The mere presence of the code repo does not necessarily mean anything. And, and yet, in this business, we get so, um, you know, you know, the clamped over somebody uh, who has uh, a code repo. Be careful. Good code is its own best documentation. Uh, I, I like using the word craftsmanship when it, when it, when it comes to software development. Um, what I like doing is looking at code with and without documentation. And, and it's kind of a, a subtle thing that if I'm going to look at someone's code, I'm going, to, I'm going to strip away some of the commenting, see if it can make sense, see if the, see if the, if, if the, the craftsmanship, you know, how it's written, how it flows, um, you know, it, it may make sense with and, well, with and without, you know, the documentation. Uh, merely having documentation and being able to understand it does not mean that's, that the code is good. There's a lot more to that than, uh, and I'm reading Matt Charney's post. Matt Charney always makes me laugh even when I'm doing a presentation. Mazel tov, Jim Matt, mazel tov. Uh, the engagement and assessment piece. You know, the engagement piece is probably the most important part, just slightly um, ahead of knowing exactly what it is you're looking for. I, I, I've said this a few times, you know, being able to, you know, have a tool that dumps out you know, the 100 best uh, software developers in, in, uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, means absolutely nothing to a company. Uh, what means something is how many of them you can get uh, to interact with you uh, at some level. And, and the some level doesn't mean, you know, when you take this job and shove it. It means thank you, no thank you, let me talk about it, let me think about it, tell me more. That's real engagement. Um, you know, just because you have the best ingredients and the best recipe and the best chef doesn't mean you're going to produce the best meal. Uh, there, there are, there's an art to doing certain things, and sometimes, for example, you know, the oven could be off. And enough with the metaphors. Let me show what I mean. The secrets to the to engagement are, uh, you know, the, the the people are the ingredients. What that really means is when you're trying to fill any position, and it just doesn't have to be tactical. These are people that you are trying to build relationships with. They're not software developers. You know, these are people who, you know, feel the same things that you do about issues of the day, about jobs, about careers, about family, about, you know, religion and finance. Um, you can't just push those things aside and say, ah, this is, you know, it's a software developer. Uh, two, you must know their likes, their dislikes, quirks, and cultural differences. Uh, I want to focus a little bit on the cultural differences. If you do any recruiting outside your country, you have to take into account, you know, the social cultural differences, how you approach people. For example, you know, you could be in your face here in the States to people, but if, if you're recruiting in, in the, anywhere in APAC, you know, there's more of a, um, I don't know, what's the word, uh, you know, a, uh, just a nicety, and not quite, you know, a, a cultural genuflection, but that's the best I can offer at this time. You know, you have to know what what things like. You know, you have to know that if if you're an open source person, uh, you're looking for some open source folks. You know, it's possible these the, some of these folks have just a, a latent genetic dislike for anything that Bill Gates ever touched. So you have to handle those things, particularly, for example, if in your stack you have some .NET stuff. You need to know these things. Uh, you have to look for tools other than the hammer. What that means is if you're using the same approach with everyone, you're not going to get the results you want. Um, some people like it, like it soft and some people like it hard, and I'll move on to the next bullet after that comment. Um, this, this, this I got from, from my friend Jeff Newman out on the West Coast. 
Uh, you know the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. When it comes to engagement, truly great engagement, you don't want to lead the horse to water. All you want to do is make them thirsty for a little bit more. You know, the problem that most recruiters take when, when trying to engage is that their approach tends to be more like waterboarding. Think about that, rather than just here's a little bit of water, here's a little bit of water, here's a little bit of water. Finally, most of all, be knowledgeable and impersonal. You know, the way you hear me now uh, with, with, uh, with my occasional uh, slip-ups on language and cursing, that's the way I am with everybody. Uh, I have one style and one style only, uh, and that's what I use. It's, it's, I, I'm not going to use the word authentic because it makes me barf. I'm honest. I tell people what I think. I make mistakes. I'm straight with them. Uh, real briefly, I want to cover uh, the outreach. I have a really good uh, response rate, ridiculously good response rate with, with emails and in-mails. Emails, my response rates are not upwards of are, are over 90%. My in-mails are close to 70%. Not all of them lead to people who say, hey, I want to talk more about that job, but uh, very, very few of them tell me to go, uh, yes. you know, screw myself. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about there eight, real briefly, there are eight components into every engagement piece that I send out. Emails, in-mails, it doesn't matter. There are eight elements to them. First one is the subject line. I call that curb appeal. So that email has to have curb appeal. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it, think about the link, the, the common LinkedIn, you know, uh, I'd like you to join my I'd like to invite you to my LinkedIn network since you're a person I trust, blah, blah, blah. We all laugh at that. Number two, the first line. Think of it, if anyone likes baseball, uh, you think about hitting a lead-off home run. That, I didn't, by the way, Katrina, I didn't pass on the hammer nail joke. Uh, I will get back to that later. A lead-off home run, you think in baseball, that is the best way to start a game. Number two, self-deprecation. Yeah, look, we know that recruiters really do suck. We can't fake that. So I, 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 I'm honest with people, and I, and I talk about it. I make fun of myself. Uh, this is one I think everyone will like, and very few use this. Very few people use it. I call it a behavioral contract. We'll get to that shortly. Uh, the company, why we're special, don't write a freaking novel in your email. You know, when you look at your job post in three quarters of the page is how great you are and all the foos foosball table and how your CEO does beer funnels. That's bullshit. You know, that's not why somebody good is going to join your company because you have foosball and beer. You want to tell them why you're special, but don't waste all their time. Um, you want to tell why. You got you to butter people up. You know, that's, 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 this is my, 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 my Yiddish, you know, mom coming in. Butter, oh, darling, darling. I'm, you're so you're so gorgeous to me. You're beautiful to me. Let me tell you why you're beautiful to me. Buttering people up. Uh, you want to tell people how you found them. They are really interested. If you do have some really cool sourcing technique, describe it to them. Show it to them. I have never found a situation in which people weren't amazed to um, hear about how you how, how I found them. And I also should tell them about me because you know I've already you know been you know know everything about them they should know a little about me and the final thing that every outreach has is what they can do next not what I can do next not what they can do for me it's all up to them quickly curb appeal always research your target group humor sometimes works in the subject line but it depends you know I, you, you folks probably many here probably wouldn't use my humor and for for, for probably good reason but you might have your own humor. Are there any controversial issues in 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 terms of the uh, you know the areas that you're recruiting for? Are there specific problems that you need to have this person solve? You can put those in the subject line. And the important thing that's many here have heard me before is the power of the ellipse. Whatever you put in your subject line, um, always have a dot 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 at the end of it. Don't leave the last. After the last word, don't leave it blank. You know what the ellipse does? It tells a person that there's more there. For example, there's a fellow that I, that I um, probably the, the most serendipitous subject line I ever used was a fellow, his name was Steve. So uh, the subject line was, we have the same first name, 
he shaved his head like I do. We both shave our heads, and he had chin hair like I do, and we have chin hair, dot, dot, dot. He told me, and he got back to me pretty quickly. He said that was the best, best, first of the best recruiter email I ever got, but that subject line was something I've never seen before, and it pulled him in. Uh, lead off home run. You know, have you ever looked at your like LinkedIn stream on Sunday afternoons, like three, four o'clock in the afternoon? It's all about we're hiring, we're hiring, we're hiring, we're hiring, we're hiring, we're great, we're great, we're hiring, we're hiring. All those types of posts. The first line, it should be something short and sweet. Maybe continue to pay to the subject line. It should have some fun. It should show your personality. I, I once sent a a, 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 a a targeted group out in February of uh, I think uh, of a winter month and I said good afternoon from slushy New York City I don't know why I, I was laughing as I was typing it if I can laugh while I type something it's probably a pretty good line either that or it's probably illegal but many many people actually came back and said I'm glad you, did, you, you didn't go into you know selling right away it, it just kind of set that email off something a little quirky about it don't be afraid to be quirky first line separate it off put some space into it that's the first thing that people are going to see when they open your email uh, look recruiters do suck they know why you're reaching out to them so you might as well be in on the game you know don't try to say that you're different they, they you know they've also really got a press in that delete key so you know make fun of yourself in the first line you say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm almost afraid to have to, to actually write this because uh, I, I think you're probably really experienced at, at deleting all these, you know, outreaches uh, that recruiters send you. Have fun with it. Make fun of yourself because that will be one of the first things that that that, that the techies will comment on. They'll say, you know, you're the first recruiter ever made fun of themselves. That's kind of refreshing. So do that. Uh, the behavioral contract. By the way, before I, I go, I'm, I, I'll um, uh, we'll figure out some way. To, I, I got a couple of uh, samples for this, uh, for these emails, and I'll get them to you. This is the most important thing I put in every outreach, and I mean this. I say so. A, I won't contact you anymore unless you want me to. B, I'll go away if you tell me to. And C, I'll help any friend of yours who might have a need to change jobs or find a job, even if they aren't in software development. Not all recruiters are, and actually how I write it, they add your fa favorite curse word here. Um, real brief story, uh, you know, a friend who you know, runs the Python group in, in New York, uh, I did this stuff, he put me, in, he told me his, his fiance was interested in uh, um, child, uh, ch uh, children's book illustration. I hooked her up uh, with several companies. And uh, you know, so I, I've, after that, I, I tend to get, I got unfettered access to it to the Python group. But a couple of uh, weeks later, uh, after the uh, the Pi Gotham conference, we, he, uh, he and I were having coffee. He reaches into his bag. He says, "Look, I want you to have this." And it was the Pi Gotham T-shirt with his fiance, and, and the logo was designed by his fiance. That's how I know this works. You help people, even if they aren't in software development. You be honest about it. You do that. You will get so much good karma back. So many, and and then you will have unfettered access to to to, to the community. It is a special way to do things, and I think every in our everyone in our profession should do this because it means that we're focusing on the entire person and not just on the part of them that fills a job. Uh, why we're special. Um, Again, you, you you don't have to go into a you know we're the leading we only hire the best and the brightest. That's bullshit. If you Google the phrase we only hire the best and the brightest, you will see millions of hits. If you say we are if if you if you Google the phrase we are an employer choice, same thing. Enough with these trite lines that everyone uses. Talk about what you're doing that actually is special. You know, don't say you're the leading company if you're not the leading company. It's much more preferred to say, you know what, we're actually number 18. But if, you know, if, but if we hire the right people, we might get to number 16 or 15, maybe 14 if they're really, really good. You know, the novels, please stop them. Stop, stop, stop. You know, they can go, if you're posting your jobs, for example, just on your website, 
website, and three quarters of the page is how great the company is, why the hell do you need your entire website? Focus on the jobs, focus on the performance, be honest. Why, why, why you're, you're, you're reaching out to them? There are many reasons why this person will be receiving your email. Tell them why, and it's not because you have an opening. Give them the real reason why you're reaching out to them. What was it you saw in them? If you don't know that and the good ones will ask you, you're going to be SOL and you're going to look real silly and they're probably not going to be interested in working with you. You know, even if you're, you're, you're intent upon sending out, you know, 500, a mass 500 person email. I know, I know uh, Amy Beth Quinn is on this. She has an incredible spreadsheet that she uses to track all the cool things about people that she's reaching out to. Uh, you know, you know, she's research goddess on Twitter. Maybe she'll share that because it's really that good. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things that I'll say is this is the only thing I'll talk about. Uh, this is a quote: Our API layer is heavy node. Since you're one of its 500 plus authors, I'm reaching out to you because others who use Node probably look up to you. It's a little bit of buttering, or as I say, butter. Write it your own way. Be honest. Why are you reaching out to people? Incidentally, even if you're doing an email, a, a, a mass, uh, a mail merge, and again, as 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 Amy and and and, and I do sometimes, is, is you know, a mail merge doesn't have to sound like a mail merge. The way I'm talking is the way my email sound, and the, my outreach sound. But there are some fields that I can insert into the mail merge. That um, that that work that flow well based upon personalized information about individual people. Sourcing cool. Demystify the black hole. Again, show them how you found them, why it's cool, and then show them yours. This is one thing I sent out. Then I read some of your your tweets and checked to see if googling your fir your first last name uh, uh, with the word forum produced posts of yours. You seem to like Biden.com. I know it looks a lot like cyber stalking, but in the recruiting world, it's called research. Get this? You know, show them what you're doing. It really is cyber stalking. Show them, demystify it, so they don't think you're just a another one of those folks who don't care about them. And by the way, I include this too. In case you dislike recruiters, feel free to Google me without the parentheses, Steve type and leave your recruiting. And see for yourself that I'm not like them. Again, it's part of making fun of our profession. You can make fun of me if you want. You can say, any, if you want to send stuff out and say, I'm glad I'm not as bald as Steve Levy, I'd probably laugh. Be my guest. Finally, it's up to you. The last thing, I give the uh, people I reach out to the power for the next move. Feel free to ping me if you need more information. Here's something I wrote about our layers. Incidentally, uh, I think folks will get this. If you click on that link, you'll go to the post. You'll see that logo cloud that I spoke about earlier. Relay this email on to those whom you think might be interested, perhaps coming off contract or pissed off that they're not doing the things they were promised in their current role. See, that's how I speak. Or I suppose ignore me if this email creeped you out. That's engagement. By the way, what's missing from this email? Did you notice I talked about anything about the job? I speak, when I, my original, the initial outreach is, I do not speak about the job at all. It's not, a, not, I speak about the job, I speak about the problems. I don't speak about we have an opening. Again, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make him drink is not what we want. We just want to make the horse thirsty. Why are you trying to sell something? And this is what almost every recruiter does. You're trying to sell them on something before they're engaged. Does that even make sense? And if you do those things, you're out and out lying. Uh, there's a group of us. Some of some of us are on are on this webinar. We we uh, we speak at some of the, many of the conferences. We share many of the emails that recruiters send us, and some of these come from pretty well-known companies and it was only a couple of a uh, couple of months ago I received an email I'm not mentioning the company and in the uh, it is an email and in the email the person wrote one of my senior sales executives saw your profile and was interested in speaking with you am I in sales no I'm a freaking recruiter so they not only did, did, did this recruiter not look at my profile they lied because you, as, you know as well as I do, if somebody, if an executive 
is really interested, that name will be in that email or in mail. So that person was lying. And I spoke to them later and they admitted they were lying. Don't lie when you outreach. Uh, we're almost uh, in the home stretch here ish. This is what techies want. They want you to be honest, they don't want you to fake it. They want to know what the real job is, not the task. If, you're do if the job description that you're trying to fill, the first line, say software developer, is first line says you will code. I mean, that's just a slap in the face. Well, no, no, no kidding, Sherlock. A software developer is going to code? Thanks for telling me that. I never knew that before. They don't care about the tasks, they want to know the problems they're going to be working on. As an example about the problems, if some of you work in an agile environment, you know those post-it notes in the old brick and mortar days? You go to your hiring manager, you ask them which three to five of these post-it notes are not getting done to your satisfaction. And by them not getting done, you're not getting to sleep at night or you're waking up with a headache at four o'clock in the morning and they point to them. And you say, so if I can find somebody to take these post-it notes off the board, how happy would you be? And they'll do their happy dance. The real job are the post-it notes, not the task about you will code. They want to know the entire stack. Even if you're hiring a front-end dev or a back-end dev, they want to see the whole thing. Again, logo cloud that I, the link that I showed you um, uh, previously. And again, if if I if we're not getting the uh, the um, uh, uh, the, the 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 slides here, I'll make sure everyone gets the logo cloud. Uh, they want to discuss your problems. They do not want to get grilled by contrived computer science one-on-one material. Um, think about how your software developers really work in the environment. Do they take multiple guest exams? Come on, people. You know, tr tr treat these treat folks when when you're when you're when you're when you're trying to reach out and out outreach and you're trying engage and you're trying to assess. Treat them like adults, not college students. They want a real mentor. Be prepared. There has to be someone there who can mentor even the most experienced person. It may not necessarily be somebody in software development. It could be someone in finance. It could be the CEO. Plan for a mentor for every person you bring on board. Have that conversation. They want to be heard once on the job. They don't want to say, well, you know, go sit in the corner, do your code, and you know, come back when that thing is, is um is finished. And this isn't just a millennial thing. Newsflash, I'm not a millennial. I want to be heard when I'm on the job. Don't just brush me aside and say, I'll oh, just get your work done, bucko. That won't work. They want to have an impact. Really, and it's not just it's not just techies. People want to be able to point to something and say, that's mine. I did that. They want to go to the grandma. Hey, granny, you want to know what I'm working on work? That. Do you have that built into your process? Can you, during the assessment, engagement assessment piece, point to things, point to other people where people are talking about, this is what I did, and I'm proud of it. If you don't, you're missing the boat. Some technical assessment mistakes that, 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 that are made ad nauseum. It's called the seven to 10 year problem. Show of hands. How many here have hiring managers say, I want someone who's got seven to 10 years experience and done all this, all this? Show your hands, I can see. I got, I got, I got, I got a camera here. Yeah, okay, a, a few of you, right? Here's how you handle that one. You go to the hiring manager, you say, okay, I understand the seven to 10 years problem, but if I find someone who, is, who, can, who, who can prove to you that they can solve these five post-it notes problems that, that we talked about, but they only have four years experience, you don't want to speak with them, right? And watch the hiring manager wilt in front of your eyes. Part of this is bias, you know. You know, hiring managers often aren't, uh, uh, you know, attuned to the ways of the world. They just see their tasks in front of them. We have to help them become better talent consumers. Uh, trusting self-assessment as a rock star. This is unfortunately uh, done often. Uh, so, Steve, on a scale of uh, one to ten. How would you describe your skill as a Python developer? Oh, I'm a 15 by far. I'm a ninja guru, samurai, rock star, thought leader. Wow. Uh, and then when Steve goes for an interview and has to deal with the other, you know, Py Pythonistas, they say, are you kidding me? This guy's a two. Never trust self-assessment. Not asking to write the right code. And then this goes to the assessment piece. 
you know, the, essentially the interview piece really, is contrived code, code that is not, is nowhere similar to what you're going to be writing on the job. It's not the right code. It's fake code. It's brain bench stuff. Uh, when, you, when, when you're hiring technical folks, you're asking them to solve specific real-world problems. Don't they think your, your assess, interview assessment should include real-world problems? I do. Oh, God, this kills me. When a hiring manager says, you know, you can I, I hire them, but not for my team. I want, to, I want to see show of hands. How many of you have seen this one? Hire, but not for my team. Another big problem. That means that manager needs a little bit of interview training. If they won't hire them, why would you want to bring them on to another team? Conversation to have with a hiring manager. Ignoring spelling errors on resume. I, I used to, when I first started getting into this, ignore uh, spelling errors on technical resumes. Here I was thinking that, well, you know, they're, they're going to be writing code. Until I, you know, I, I, I hit a couple of situations where uh, I, I noticed that those who had spelling errors on their resumes, once they hired, were making... Uh, uh, essentially spelling errors during their codes. So right now I will not hire anyone who doesn't, uh, whose resume really, not just the spelling is right, but you know how sometimes you look at resumes and you know some of these accomplishments, accomplishments have periods at the end and others don't? I like asking them, do they have any special algorithm to decide which ones go? That bothers me. Spelling errors, grammar errors, errors of I don't know what's the, what's the word. Just lightheaded errors bother me, and 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 they they tell me that there may be a problem later on. Yeah, is it picky? Yes, I'm not changing. Uh, not focusing on technical and people skills during the interview. You know, communication skills. Um, you have to be able to to interact with people. Uh, you know, you can't hire somebody who's uh, you know just uh, you know it, it goes into their office and you know comes to work puts their headphones on, it doesn't interact with people the whole day. I just don't buy into that, not, not in, my, in my world. Uh, fear of hiring someone better. You know, if we hire someone better than Matt, that means Katrina over there, who is our, who is our senior person, she may not feel really good. And, uh, you know, so we can't hire Matt because he may be better than Katrina. Obviously, this is a false thing because in the real world, Katrina is better than Matt. But don't be afraid of hiring someone better. S hiring someone better raises the bar for everybody if they're managed well. Putting all this assessment together. Uh, these are some things um, that should always, you know, I'm always A-B testing my process. There's nothing, perfectionism is a very slow death. You know, always look for ways to improve your existing process. Just because someone, cut your hire a new head of software development, bring them into your environment, and they bring in their stuff, doesn't mean that is the best thing for your environment. Always find ways to A-B test. Talk to the people who've gone through it. Talk to the people who've interviewed. Ask them what they liked and ask them what they didn't like. How do you know that something works? How do you know that it doesn't work? You can't take these tests for gospel. You have to always find ways to improve them. Always incorporate how you really work into the assessment process, whether you're Scrum, Agile, Waterfall, Paired, TDD, BDD, Design Patterns, how do you really work? If you really work in a group of, of uh, you know, paired, compar you, you, you do paired programming, and your interviewing does not include paired programming, how do you know they're going to work? If you have a situation where you have a team of four, and you're trying to fill in a, you know, you have three people, you're trying to fill in a fourth person, not having all three people being part of the process literally in a table means you're missing out on the opportunity to see how people interact. Always work these things into your process. Most important thing, look to see how your best developers work. Analyze them, look at them, take them out to lunch, buy them coffee, play foosball with them. Get them to describe how they really work. Understand it. And then ask yourself, are those elements of work built into our assessment process? Because you really want to find out people, find people who are like your best developers. And then maybe they'll become the best developers, and then the bar gets raised higher and higher. Finally, uh, community matters. You know, uh, yeah. 
people don't come to work simply to code. They want to be part of something that's even larger than the company. Do you even care about this? Do you, do you just have a throwaway question about what they like to do on the side, or do you really go into that with them? Do you talk about you know what, what social, political, it's okay to talk about those things, people. Find out what things really get them jazzed, and, and see if you can find a way to work those into their employment. It may be uh, you know, time off. It may be a, a sabbatical type thing. Find a way to bring what really matters to a person into the company. 360 degree relationships. Are you building all relationships into your process? You know, if it's if if you're just having a you know a head of development and then uh, one or two peers, everyone who has uh, a stake in working with that person, even if they're outside of development, should be part of the process. How do you define and score great code, or will you know it when we see it? We hate that from hiring managers when it comes to uh, recruiting. Do you know? Just send me more resumes. I'll know a great person when I see them. You know, if they can't describe it, they will not know it when they see it. So you should have essentially a scorecard for whatever your code test is, knowing what good, bad, ugly, and great code is, and have a process for code for 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 for, for scoring it. If you don't, you're just being subjective. Um, do you care about what really excites them? How can your company help them achieve this goal? Little different than earlier, they like doing things, but how can working for your company help them achieve those personal goals that they have? It's not just software development. There's a personal, there's an emotional content to it. Always use humor. Humor. This is one of my favorite questions. If you had just boarded a plane and discovered that your team of programmers had been responsible for the flight control software, would you immediately disembark? I want some of you to write that down and ask that the next to the next uh, developer, technical person that you interview, and ask them what they think about that. Ask them, you know, it'll tell you, you know, when you think about your code, you know, ask them about their previous word environment. What do they think about that? That gives you some more information, especially, uh, you know, you 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 can delve into what's true and what's not true. Uh, look, the recent history assessment, you know, we've gone from crystal ball stuff to all these great tools, resource, AAVY, Dice of Winnetlo, Guild, Talent, and Hackathons, Code Challenges, ad infinitum. They're coming up every month. Uh, every month there's, uh, you know, there, there's a review somewhere uh, on, 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 on a recruiting site about all these new things. Um, code testing today uh, has to be real life to be predictive. If it's contrived, it is not predictive. If it's not the way you really work, it is not predictive. Uh, hire for performance. Don't hire for school. I know one company, uh, uh, their president said, we only hire developers who went to Cornell. And I just, I remember sitting with them, and I just broke into the far above Cayuga waters. That's the Cornell fight song. And and I, I, I had no, no response to that. Um, you know, so but I, I did say so. If I hire, if I bring someone from Harvard who can perform, you wouldn't be interested. Well, we're not happy with them. You can't, you can't. Fight, sometimes you can't fight City Hall. Code challenges differentiate good from great developers. You know, broken code, obfuscated code. Do this quickly. You know, uh, architect it out. Look for the difference between the great people and the not so great people. Have your employees, whatever code challenges or hackathons you want to employ, have your best developers do it. Have your not best developers do it. Look at the difference. Hackathons are the new career fairs. You know, since great programmers live everywhere, you need to engage them everywhere. One of the things that I like to do in terms of engaging, um, it, it's kind of old school, but you know when you go to supermarkets, they have those community boards, you know, uh, you know, uh, looking at a math tutor, apartment for rent. Do this, and it really works. Write up a really good tear sheet, you know, with the things you tear off at the bottom, you know, with 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 some code stuff, you know, looking for this, that. Make it fun, make it lively, and put it on the community boards. I guarantee you that that you will get some great people who are shopping for food to call you or email you on the basis for what it, what it is you uh, put on the community board. I know it sounds odd and bizarre, but it really does work. Uh, so finally, this is, the, this is essentially the last thing. Think about, before we go, 
think about your assessment process. Think about your engagement process. Take a post-it note out or write down a piece of paper the one thing that you would like to improve in your engagement and the one thing you'd like to improve in your assessment. Then ask the same thing of your hiring managers. And an answer, it's great, and leave it as it is, it's not an answer. Get them to think about it. What if you really wanted to change something? What would it be? Always continue to push the bar. And so here I now, if there are any questions, uh, I know it's just uh, four minutes shy of three o'clock. You can either ask questions here or um, you can email them to me at levy.steve at gmail. Uh, Dan, Katrina, you back on now? Yes, we are here. Uh, thank you so much, Steve. Um, members, as Steve mentioned, we do have a couple of minutes here uh, for questions. I know there's been a couple that have drifted in. If you guys are still thinking of something, go ahead and get it into the question box, and we'll make sure we're going to get as many as we can answered. Anything we don't, we'll be forwarding on to Steve. So definitely, uh, even though time is limited, we will try to get answers for everybody. But and you um, know, and yeah, everyone knows here that you know you you uh, you you want to send me a question, I'll I'll answer you privately. I'll tweet it out to you. Uh, whatever whatever works. Uh, if you want to, you know, talk to me, you know that phone thingy. Uh, you can email me. We could set something up. I can do a hangout, do a Skype. Uh, if you're in the area, I can do it for coffee. Uh, that always works. Good. And if not, uh, you know, I don't see anything coming through. Oh, Steve, I've got one that came in earlier from uh, Jeff. Jeff, thank you for listening. Thank you for engaging with us. Jeff's question was uh, specifically around phone interviews and remote. Uh, you offered a lot of great advice about uh, like the whiteboards and things. Um, any any technology fixes you would have for recruiters who are trying to connect and uh, only have the option of like some phone and maybe computer connectivity where they could use some of those in-person challenges? Well, the thing is, well, the, the, the tough way to it. If, 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 you, if you, all you have is the phone, uh, you know, there, there, there's, there's really little you can do. Uh, but if you know that you're only going to have a phone, then you can also, you, you can email them ahead of time. Hey, can you just draw me your current, whatever questions you want to ask, draw me. Draw them to it. Draw, draw me and send them to me ahead of time, so we can discuss those things. Um, you know, I, I'm sure there are. You know, I, I with with Hangouts and Skypes. Uh, you know, I, I have no problem. You know, honestly, I, I I do a lot of, you know, low tech stuff. I'll take a I'll take a pad of paper when I'm having a Skype or a Hangout, and I'll draw on it and I'll hold it up to the screen, up to the camera. Um, you know, I, I I'm sure there are better tools. But, you know, sometimes I just I I I I'll look at them, but that that's actually a good question. But when it comes time to, you know, the phone stuff, and if all you have is a phone, you just have to be you work at the interview interviewing uh, skills. You have to ask questions. You you may have to send them questions ahead of time that they can prepare and you can discuss them. Um, I don't I you know if there's other ways, please you know pop it into the uh, the Twitter stream with the hash RBC Live. Um, and, and, and go from there. Uh, that's that's the best I can do. You know, I have Jeff. Is, is, I wonder if it's a Jeff I know. It might be. If 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 this either way, if uh, Jeff, just email me because this is a much broader uh, uh, topic and and probably would warrant uh, an article on recruiting blogs. Great. Uh, or, Jeff, so definitely feel free to reach out to uh, Steve on there. And Steve, I definitely think that the uh, your your kind of choosing the tone and the humor and how you interact with them goes such a long way. And I think that's probably one of the things I take away with was um, a lot of the specific instances that leverage a bit of your background knowledge on engineering and, and programming, but also like being able to have some humor and engage people because I think maybe some people get a lot of the what, but they don't understand the how. And I think a lot of the advice you gave here was really great advice on how they can be interact with people and hopefully build a bit of that uh, relationship and not just come off like every other douchebag recruiter out of there. You know, now let me throw one thing in just, I, I know and for the, for the dwindling numbers that are leaving, well, 65 now, um, East coast versus West coast recruiting, you know, as, as much as it, 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 it pains me to say so, Firstly, great recruiting is great recruiting. It doesn't matter whether you're agency, whether you're corporate, whether you're East Coast, whether you're West Coast. It doesn't matter what content continent you're on. Great recruiting is great recruiting. And, and the bottom line to great recruiting is, is honesty. It's communication. It's knowledge. But I think, you know, we have, um, you know, I have friends of mine who, are, who, who recruit on the West Coast. And, you know, some of these things, look, I, I, there's, there's no doubt that I'm, I can be a little – brusque <laughs> uh, in your face, um, but I'm not going to lie. 
and uh, but but I, but there's a some sometimes certain areas of the country or certain areas of the globe require a softer approach and I use it you know when I do APAC recruiting it's definitely a much softer approach uh, do I do not use my potty mouth when I when I when I recruit in, uh, in, in, in the Asia region I just don't do that uh, but you need to know your audience and you need to modify your message accordingly and uh, but you always the most important thing is you know there's a reason why uh, you know those of us who are you know been doing this for a long time we will never ever I think Jimmy Stroud said it uh, best on a Facebook thread uh, a couple of days ago. Um, none of us, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, none of us will ever refer to ourselves as gurus, ninjas, samurais, experts, thought readers, and other crap like that because, and I'm telling the truth, folks, there's not a single one of my peers who isn't learning something new every day. And Every day, I I I, li I doesn't I don't care where I get it from. It doesn't matter the age of the person. Doesn't matter the yeah you know, anything. I get good stuff from everybody. I'm gonna be looking back in the Twitter stream and getting some really cool things. And I swear to goodness, I will never be a ninja guru samurai expert. Samurai. I won't because that means I've stopped learning. And and that's the most important thing that we can offer in this profession is always be aware of best practices. Try them. See what works for you. Create your own best practices and then tell the community about it. That's how we're all going to get better at this. That's how we're going to quite, quite honest, honestly fight the problem that we've created for ourselves where, where many people in, for example, the technical community simply believe that we're douchebags. Harsh word, but if you Google the phrase recruiters are douchebags, you'll see what I'm talking about. We have to do better and we have to educate the people who aren't doing better. One final note, when you receive a hideous email from a recruiter that you know is really bad, don't just delete it. Respond back to them and tell them what you thought about it and tell them what your response was to it. Always be improving. That's it. Thank you, Steve. Uh, great advice. Kind of uh, channel your inner uh, Otto von Bismarck and Iron Fist and the Velvet Club huh. there. As opposed, to Glenn, as opposed to Glenn Gary, Glenn yeah. Ross. <laughs> Members, we, uh, I'm afraid that we've run out of time for today's webinar. Uh, I don't want to shut anyone down. So if you guys feel like continuing that conversation out on Twitter, use that hashtag, hashtag RBC Live, and you can continue to uh, have a conversation out there. I'll be hanging out there. I'm sure uh, Katrina, Matt, and Steve will be there for a little bit as well. Also, if you didn't get your question or it came to you late or you were shy kind of uh, on, on the webinar, send me an email, daniel at recruitingdaily.com. I'll definitely try to do what I can to get an answer for you. But I um, do want to say one more thing to our guest, Steve. Thank you to Hacker Rank for sponsoring today's content. And, of course, members, biggest thank you of all goes out to all of you. Thank you for choosing to spend an hour of your